Young Alamegans were playing around Rolgar's Reach. One of the youths said they saw something amazing the last time they were here and wanted to show their friends. They were skeptical, but decided to indulge her. Around the base of the cliff, they sat and waited, getting baked by the afternoon sun as their friend insisted that they needed to be patient if they were to see it. Their friends were about to give up and go home until a pair of robed figures began to walk out together onto a raised platform. One of them was wearing a robe of yellowish gold, the other wearing a robe of dark purple. The girl insisted this was what they were waiting to see, and they all watched with bated breath. Soon, the golden figure stopped, allowing the other to continue so that they might get in position and turn to face them. Both of these individuals brought their hands together and presented each other with a deep and respectful bow. With the ceremony concluded, both figures assumed different stances, as the air became dead quiet. The young Alamegans didn't see what happened next, as the dark-robed person practically disappeared. Their stance was broken, and their fist had collided with the light-robed figure. It took the children a moment to realize it was an attack, and their opponent had blocked it. Soon, the lighter-robed fighter answered this assault with a flurry of kicks, forcing their opponent to back off and try again. Over and over, these two dashed, collided, and fought. At first, it was like watching a dance. But as their battle raged on, the raw force of their strikes became so obvious that even the children knew that no normal person could survive such an attack. Their robes began to shine with brilliant lights. The darker robe was like a black sun devouring the light around it. And the brighter robe shined like the dawn's reflection off of the freshly fallen snow. Finally, their fight erupted with a clash that caused a shockwave to ripple through Rolger's reach. The young ones were in shock at this tangible display of power, only to hear the crumbling of rocks as they realized that the battle had loosened a stack of boulders above them. The children screamed and shut their eyes as the rocks began to fall, catching the attention of the two fighters who paused their battle. They both realized what was happening in an instant, and without a moment's hesitation, they both rushed across the reach. Together, they broke apart and moved aside all the falling stones so that only dust may touch their audience. The kids that had wanted to see their duel opened their eyes and saw them. A man and woman standing tall, their brutal fists opening up and offering the most gentle of hands as the two helped escort the young ones from Rolger's reach. They lectured the kids on snooping around, but ended their meeting on a high note offering them the chance to watch up close next time within the Temple of the Fist. Welcome back, my friends! Today, we're headed up to the northeastern mountains of Eorzea to analyze a discipline that almost ended up running an entire country. The practitioners of this art train themselves both body and soul to honor and pay respect to Rolger, God of Destruction. While dangerous, they truly believe in peace. That devastation should only serve to remove things that would put an end to harmony, such as the will of Rolger himself. So today, my friends, let us come together so that we might meditate and reflect on what it means to truly give yourself to the heat of battle. Today, let us discuss what it means to be a monk. The origins of this respectable art can trace their roots all the way back to the Sixth Umbral Calamity. During the great floods caused by the Calamity of Water, many people were desperate to find safety from the rising tides. Many here found salvation in a wayward comet that shone brilliantly as it raced across the night sky. The comet burned with a radiant light and showed the way north into the high mountains of Girabanya. So broad and mighty were these mountains that even the flooding of the world could not drown them. The Hure and other species that were guided north by the comet found sanctuary in these majestic mountains. The comet was heralded as a blessing from Rolger himself, and this devotion to the God of Destruction eventually evolved into an organized religion, becoming known as the Fist of Rolger. In the early years of this religion, they were still finding their identity as a monastic group. They of course spent many days in prayer to Rolger, 
which steadily evolved into deep meditation and self-reflection. This was all well and good, but they wished to praise Rogar through the methods this god was known for. Destruction Of course, mindless violence against the land and its people would be utter madness. So eventually, they took to a different approach. Instead of showcasing their will to destroy against Girabanya, the followers of the Fist would do so against each other. This is what began the long-standing traditions of ritual combat that the Fist of Ralgar is known for. As such, in the 6th century of the 6th Astral Era, the monks of the Fist of Ralgar were officially a recognized and respected discipline. The Fist of Ralgar would make the mountains of Girabanya their home, but they didn't choose just any location. They would spend centuries carving the stone and cliffs into beautiful shapes and practical housing. The monks even crafted a gigantic statue in the likeness of their guardian deity to show their devotion. At the top of these mountains would finally rest the Temple of the Fist, with the surrounding cliffs becoming known as Ralgar's Reach. The lake at the center of the reach was said to have been formed when the guiding comet finally landed in Girabanya, making this a holy site for the monks and would-be pilgrims. What began as a mild martial art to praise a god steadily became more of an elegant yet aggressive form of combat. The monks of the fist would use their bodies and souls to do battle with one another, but it was through meditation and the abandonment of oneself that they discovered the thing that would solidify their new martial art. They discovered the nature of what they called chakras. By mastering chakras, the monks were able to develop attacks and techniques that could turn a normal punch or kick into something that could obliterate a massive object in a single motion. Their goal was to become a force of nature, one that could easily destroy all that opposed them, but willingly choose not to. By becoming that powerful and humble at the same time, it is said that the monks reach enlightenment and walk the same path as the god of destruction himself. Eventually, the country of Alamigo would be founded by Anshelm Kotter in the year 1135. This means that the monks of Girabanya predate Alamigo by almost several hundred years. Despite this, the Fist of Ralgar kept to themselves and remained separate from the city-state for centuries. Not only were the monks devoted to their training and meditation, but Ralgar's Reach had become a famous site of pilgrimage for those wishing to honor the Twelve Gods. The Reach had become so popular that members of the Fist created a tavern and inn for visitors and initiates. What's more, there was never any trouble since the monks themselves would deal with any bandits or monsters that plagued the area. But this all changed after Alamigo's failed invasion of Gridania. After the failure of the Autumn War, Alamigo was thrown into chaos as their economy collapsed, creating constant civil unrest. This was eventually a problem that the Fist of Ralgar couldn't ignore. The monkhood descended from the mountains, using their overwhelming power to end the violence quickly and establish order. The monks were so efficient in calming the citizenry and restoring balance to Alamigo that the king's power and authority was threatened. Before all faith in the crown could disappear, the king named the Fist of Ralgar as Alamigo's official religion, thus granting the high-ranking monks a seat as advisors to the throne. They were even bestowed with honorary roles in Alamigo's military. This pleased the people of Alamigo, knowing that the monks would help bring balance and prosperity to their country. This worked extremely well for a time, as the monks' philosophy meant they couldn't be corrupted by things like political influence or financial gains. But all of this ended with the reign of Theodric I, also known as the Mad King. Theodric was completely insane, and saw enemies in every shadow of his castle. Eventually, he saw the monks of the Fist as a threat to his rule and devised a plan to remove them. The Mad King proclaimed that Nimia the Spinner had anointed him as her chosen vassal 
and that the monks must submit to his rule just like how Rolger hearkened to the voice of the goddess. Understandably, the monks were disgusted by this turn of events, and openly objected. But this is what Theodric wanted, and in the year 1552, he used their open defiance as an excuse to brand them as traitors and execute them. This caught the Fist of Rolger completely by surprise. Monks and priests were assassinated without pity as Alamigo's standing army was made to burn Rolger's reach. Soon, the monks began fighting for their lives, but they were so greatly outnumbered that even the strongest among them was getting overrun. Senior monks began to willingly engage in losing battles just to give their apprentices the chance to run from Giribania and the Mad King's bloodlust. Very few members of the Fist of Rogger survived that purge, and for a time, people thought that the monks of the Fist were gone for good. But recently, at the dawn of the Seventh Astral Era, survivors of the purge and those that had inherited a monk's soulstone have been making their way back to Rogger's Reach. It may be very soon that the thunderous sounds of ritual combat shall echo through Giribania once more. And that is the brief recounting of the monk's labored history. But now let us turn our attention to the powers and abilities that scared the Mad King so much in the first place. As stated, the monks practice a martial art that is entirely unique to the Fist of Rogger. Training to become a monk was intense, and as such, not everyone in the Temple of the Fist was a martial arts master. In fact, many members of the Fist of Rogger were simply priests, philosophers, and crafters, but those that trained hard enough did indeed become apprentice monks. While the martial art handed down through the fist is uniquely powerful, it's the control of chakras that sets a monk apart from all other disciplines in our world. In all honesty, chakra is just another name for one's personal pool of aether. But the monks of the fist discovered that someone's body naturally has limiters, or gates, that prevent excessive release or use of aether. Under normal circumstances, these closed chakra gates ensure that someone doesn't spend or lose their aether unnecessarily. Without them, people could lose their aether all at once and die from it. But through ritual combat, the monks realized that these gates could be forced open, allowing for the vast channeling of aether through their entire bodies. What was normally a casual stream became a raging river. This much aether being made to flow through their bodies is the true strength behind a monk. It elevates their bodies to another level, allowing them to move at blinding speeds and deliver attacks that could easily break stone and metal. It's said that there are seven chakra gates in one's body, and monks train night and day to be able to open the seventh chakra. This was originally the mark of mastery, but shortly before the betrayal of the Mad King, the monks began to realize that the seven points were each dual aspected, a gate of light and a gate of darkness. Seven chakra points, each with two gates meaning that a monk could only be considered a supreme master if they've opened all 14 chakra gates and gained complete control over their ethereal flow. This is extremely difficult, and for some monks, the only way to reach that mountaintop is the abandonment of worldly thoughts and desires. This is reflected in one of their meditative stances called Anatman, which encourages the monk to dissolve who they think they are so that their aether may flow unrestrained. Only a handful of men and women even come close to reaching this state, and even fewer are known to open all 14 gates. But if a monk is successful in opening all 14, they gain a level of combat instinct that could even make demons fearful. Lastly, let's go over their choice of weapons and attire. There's not a whole lot to be said about a monk's weapons since their entire body is their primary weapon. Unlike all the other disciplines I've covered so far, monk doesn't use any special gear or tools to bring their combat efficiency to its peak. 
though it is indeed common for many monks to make use of weapons that ensure that their fists don't become too heavily damaged from prolonged battles. These fist weapons take so many varieties and forms that I can't even begin to explain them all. But the common trait they all share is to increase damage dealt to their target, as well as protect the monk's hands from excessive damage. This is reasonable, since a fist fighter isn't as dangerous with broken hands. All that being said, many accomplished monks opt to use enchanted gloves or hand wraps instead of a cumbersome weapon. This way, a monk gains the benefit of having something akin to a weapon while still being considered unarmed. Lastly, let us review their choice of attire. A monk's garb is actually quite storied. Given to their humble and modest philosophy, a monk's clothes used to be a large singular cloth that was wrapped around their entire body in an elegant fashion. But over time, and with the discovery of the chakras, this design evolved. Their clothes would always fit loosely to ensure their movements were never in danger of being restricted. But eventually, their attire was enchanted to encourage their aether flow, and thus, have an easier time controlling their chakra gates. This resulted in an honored tradition where an apprentice monk would spin the aether conductive threads that would be used to make their robes. During their training, their robes would slowly be woven, and upon completion of their training, they would finally be able to wear them. This makes a monk's chosen attire unique and enchanted. Not only that, but the enchantment is said to also prevent the interference of ambient aether. That way, a monk's chakra may flow uninterrupted by foreign powers. And that, my friends, is my recounting of the story of the monks. In truth, the monks of the fist did more good for Garibania than Alamigo ever achieved. So there is something to be said about the philosophies created by the fist of Rogger. They gain power, but not for power's sake, but the idea of something greater than themselves. To those that walk the path of the monk, hear me now. Yours is a path many have walked, and one that all respect. Through humility, you found focus. Through patience, you discovered virtues. And through training, you realized power. With all this in your mind and in your heart, your fists will make short work of all things that would stand to ruin the tranquility of the garden that is your world, and likely make the god of destruction himself proud to call you his disciple. Hello everyone! Thank you so much for watching till the end of the video. I know you all are tired of hearing this, but if you really want to show me some love, liking the video, subscribing to the channel, or even just leaving a comment would do wonders for me. It lets me know I'm doing a good job and helps me reach even more people. But to those that really want to go above and beyond helping me and the channel, I have created a Patreon. Links in the description. I have to give a big shout out to Valen, Potato, Monsolo97, and Daniel Campos for all showing me such massive support. It really does mean more to me than you know. But that being said, I'm so happy you stayed and watched through my content. I'll always be putting out material so long as you want to watch it. That being said, I need to start working on the next video. Till then, stay safe my friends!